Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. We're going to finish up the chapter today with another one of these letters from heaven, the letter to the church at Thyatira. Um, and I've titled this lesson, Tolerance or Treason. You know, talking about California out there, buddy, I tell you what, it's, it's a rough place. But you know what, if they can't find a good Southern Baptist church, I would highly recommend a Calvary Chapel church. Very biblical, verse by verse, uh, exposition of the Bible. Um, pretty much in line with Southern Baptist beliefs all the way through. So if they can't find a Southern Baptist church, just tell them to look for a Calvary Chapel and they can't go wrong out there. But uh, this church uh, that we're looking at today, they, they had a problem. They had a problem with compromise. Now we've looked at uh, several of these uh, letters to the churches. We've looked at the first church, which was <laughs> Ephesus. You remember them? They were a hardworking, doctrinally pure church, but a church that had left its first love for Jesus. And then the letter to uh, those in Smyrna. It was a church that was persevering through persecution. Um, and then last week we looked at the letter to the church at Pergamum, um, which was a church serving where Satan had his throne. You remember that? Um, and this morning we come again uh, to this fourth letter, the letter to the tiny church at Thyatira. So let's look at verse 18. This is the longest one, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, and we begin in verse 18. You don't mind? Kick us off there. Thanks. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things say the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his mm. feet like fine brass. Yep. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented of and I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Mm. Now to you I say, and to the rest of thy power, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. Mm. To him who overcomes and denies my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. Mm. You will rule them with an iron scepter. You will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him be with the spirit say to the church. All right, thank you. So, as always in Scripture, there is around every corner a surprise, something unexpected. Uh, and it's no less true in these letters uh, from heaven, for in this middle letter, the fourth letter, we find that the Lord dictated the largest letter to the smallest church. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? It's kind of ironic that this little church gets the biggest letter, uh, because Thyatira, it was a tiny town. In fact, um, Pliny the Elder, uh, ancient Roman historian, uh, lumped this town with many other insignificant hamlets that dotted the landscape of the Roman Empire when he said this. He said, there is Thyatira and other places of insignificance. So, I mean, it was just a, it was just a little dot on the map. It was kind of like one of those places that has a caution light in the middle of town and that's all you get, right? It was one of those places like that. And so the choice of Thyatira strongly suggests that our Lord's criteria of judgment, his standard of measurement is different from ours. I mean, now we would expect if the Lord was going to write a letter to a church here in the Morristown area, that he would probably write a letter to us since we're one of the big dogs in the town, right? I mean, or Manly, or Arrowhead, or what is it, the Avenue, the hot church now in the area. Uh, so, you know, you wouldn't expect him to write a letter to the church I grew up in, saved and baptized in, Grace Baptist Church. They wouldn't, I don't even think they have 100 people. Or maybe Macedonia or Holtz or 
Catherine Nenny is another one I think of. Little, little churches, you know, that you, you just don't think a lot of that probably would struggle to reach 100 in attendance. And yet our Lord writes one of these seven letters from heaven to a church like one of those. A little church, right? And uh, the reason that he wrote them, of course, is that they, this tiny church had a big problem, and it's a problem that churches have faced throughout the ages, and that problem is the problem of tolerance. Tolerance, putting up with evil in the church. And it's a problem in our day. Now, you know, now that moral uh, absolutes have been stripped from American society, and the only virtue that's being heralded is the virtue of tolerance, right? I mean, that's, that is the highest value and moral position that we can occupy in this society, according to those who are politically correct, we need to be tolerant, right? I mean, that's, that's really what, what is being said. And, and, and tolerance is a perfectly good word. It has a biblical foundation to it. There, there's a certain you know, way of looking at that word that is good and right and true and beautiful and something that we ought to cultivate, um, you know, tolerance. But when it comes to evil, we can't do that, right? We, we can't do that. And especially in the body, in the church, right? Um, you know, but again, there's, this has been completely flipped on its head, redefined by this culture to mean that, you know, uh, you, you, you've got to accept everybody's religion, everybody's uh, truth claim, everybody's agenda, everybody's sexual preference and orientation, everybody's everything, lifestyle, whatever, and deem it as being equal in value or maybe even superior to that of your own. That's what tolerance means now. And so when people throw that word out there, uh, it's not exactly the same as what we would uh, define it biblically. It's totally different. Um, and, and so now we've got this, you know, go along, get along, what's right for you may not be right for me, what's wrong for you may not be wrong for me. Um, and so you've got to accept me and affirm me and now celebrate me as I am or otherwise you are intolerant right and you know it's interesting the most intolerant people that I've ever met are those who preach this exactly. <laughs> it is unbelievable how hateful these people are who are calling me the one who's hating <laughs> by saying I just affirm biblical truth and what has worked for millennia, which is that marriage ought to be between a man and a woman exclusively because that's what works best for children. The sociological studies show it um, and experience shows it, that that's the best way. God's way is right. I mean, it's best. It works practically, not just biblically true, but it practically works out in society true. And any other way of doing things is not going to work well. It's going to fail. <laughs> it's going to cause problems. I mean, we've got enough problems with trying to do it biblically, right? But when you go off the track here from what this book teaches, then you really got problems. But those are the most intolerant people uh, around today. Now, I don't know whether it makes sense or not, but there are some people who are very intolerant of you when you choose to be narrow-minded about certain things, but we have to be. I mean, think about it for a second. I'm fascinated by the fact that the very same people who condemn you and condemn me for being narrow-minded, they want their airline pilot to be very narrow-minded about flying the plane that they get on. They want their doctor to be very narrow-minded when it comes to taking out a malignant tumor that they have. They want their pharmacist to be very narrow-minded about the right medication that they dispense out of the pharmacy, but they don't want you or me to be narrow-minded when it comes to the most important thing, which is your eternal soul. That Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. They say, oh, no, 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 no. That's very intolerant. 
Did you know that this week, uh, Greg Laurie, um, California again, sorry, Bill, <laughs> Carrie, I'm, I'm sorry, but great guy, love, gr love Greg Laurie. I uh, did the National Day of Prayer several years ago. I had to confess in front of a big audience that I'd stolen some of his material. Uh, <laughs> he laughed about it. But um, they banned his billboard out in California. He was holding up a Bible in the billboard. And some people had called the billboard company and they said that that was offensive to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, the message was very positive, very loving, you know. But the Bible itself was being held up in a picture and they said that was intolerant. We, we can't stand that. So they took the billboards down. I don't know if you've read about this. I mean, he's doing this crusade this weekend. I think today's the last day. Um, but it's just incredible, how, you know, what people t do. And, they, you know, they say, well, it's not nice to, to be narrow-minded, to be intolerant like that. A and yet, you know, they are that way when it comes to all these other issues, whether it's a pilot flying a plane or a pharmacist dispensing medication or whether it's a surgeon dealing with their cancer. Uh, but again, when it comes to your eternal soul, that's off limits <laughs> when it comes to telling truth to people. It's amazing. But here's what we're dealing with. Th these people in this church here uh, were putting up with something that they should have put out in the church. Uh, they were tolerating something that they shouldn't tolerate because it was literally a cancer that was eating away at the life and the vitality of this church in Thyatira. And so, let's see what the risen Lord said to them. First of all, of course, there's this identification, right? Uh, remember, it's always sent to the angel of the church, the messenger of the church, the pastor of the church, and then he identifies himself, Jesus does, as to who he is sending this letter. And he says, first of all, that these are the words of who? The Son of God. This is the only time that he makes this reference to himself in this. And there's something interesting that happens in in the Greek that you don't see in the English um, and a lot of structure in the in the Greek text is what I call a chiasmus which is after the Greek letter chi looks like an X but this fourth letter right here is, is there's an em always an emphasis in the chiastic structure of stuff and you got a seven you got seven churches right it's kind of interesting, just give you a little tidbit here of, of Greek study, but you got Ephesus and what was what was their big problem? What was their big problem? They had a lack of love. And what was the Laodiceans problem? We'll get to it, but they were lukewarm. I mean they didn't love Jesus enough either, so really love. Uh, and then you had the second church with Smyrna. And they were persecuted, but they were pretty much, I mean, everything was positive. And then down here you got Philadelphia. The sixth church. And it was pretty much a positive message. It's interesting how they're arranged. I'm just saying, if you look here, there's parallels here, there's parallels here, and then you got Pergamum, and you got Sardis, the church that had a name and it was alive, but it was dead. It had problems, it had problems, and then there's Thyatira in the middle. And Thyatira is the only one where he identifies himself as the Son of God. Anyway, sorry, I mean, I don't mean to get too deep crazy with you, but I just want you to see in a chiastic structure, emphasis is at the fourth spot when you got a list of seven, and boom, right there, he says, I'm the Son of God. So that is kind of the message about Jesus in this whole thing. You can look at all the other IDs that he throws out here in all these other churches, but this is the thing, this is the takeaway. That's what he wants you to know. <laughs> about himself. He's the Son of God. And then he pulls, you know, two details, right, out of this vision, just like he did with the other letters. He pulls two details out. And what are they? His eyes and his feet. Yes, his eyes and his feet. 
Remember, omniscient in his vision. His eyes are like blazing fire. When, when John turned to see the voice, right, and he saw the risen reigning royal Christ, he saw one whose eyes streamed shafts of liquid fire, just like a laser beam. The, and, and what's the, the idea there? That it cuts through everything down to the heart. That it cuts through the veneer, it cuts through the facade, it cuts through the masks down to the, to, to the living, breathing, pulsating heart of the matter so that he sees who you are really. And there's nothing hidden from his sight. Remember that? Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything's laid bare and uncovered before the eyes of him to whom he must give an account. So this morning, he sees through our pious looks. He sees through uh, our, our secrets. He knows our motives. He knows why we're here. He knows what we're thinking. He knows, you know, our heart. He knows everything about us. He can see it. Nothing is hidden from his piercing, probing, and penetrating vision. But he not only identifies himself as the one who's omniscient in his vision, but omnipotent in his judgment. Because he's about to pronounce judgment on this church, right? So it's important. So what is, he, what is his feet? The feet are like? What are they like? Bronze. Burnished bronze. Burnished bronze, symbol of in the Old Testament. Remember? We've already talked about it. He's used this before. Judgment. Right. In the Old Testament. Um, that's what it was. So this description of bronze had been smoldering in a furnace renders the picture of this sovereign figure walking about with feet on fire. And everywhere the foot falls, there's judgment happening. And that detail is interesting when you contrast the first coming of the Lord with the second coming of the Lord, which is going to be completely different. You remember when Jesus of Nazareth walked the shores of Galilee, his, his, his footfall in the sand uh, it was wiped away by the waves. I mean, it was gone, just like any other man. But when he comes in the unwinding of time, at the end of days, he's coming as the cosmic Christ. Not Jesus, meek and mild, <laughs> but as the cosmic Christ who's going to be the judge of the earth, of the quick and the dead, and of our deeds, whether they're good or bad, right? 2 Corinthians 5.10. So this is what we're seeing here, is this holy and righteous judge and that's how he presents himself to this church and to us, the Son of God, who's omniscient in his vision and omnipotent in his judgment. Now, beyond the identification, he moves on to the commendation, which I love about the Lord Jesus. He starts with the positive, doesn't he? Isn't it nice when people start with the positive? You know, I, doing a personnel review with your boss sometimes is really tough. And when they start out with the negative, it's like, man, it's got to go all downhill from here. <laughs> this is not good, right? But he starts with the positive, and he said a number of, of, of nice things, really, to this tiny church in Thyatira. He says, I know your deeds. I know your deeds. He knows our deeds. He knows what we're up to, right? Um, and he unfolds what he means by deeds in the four words that follow. First, the invisible motivations and then the visible demonstrations. Invisible motivations of love and faith, and then the visible demonstrations of service and perseverance. So our Lord, whose eyes could see what others could not see, saw these two pairs of virtue. First of all, their invisible motivation of love matched their visible evidence of service. He says, when I look at your church, I see no breach in the membership, no break in the fellowship. I, when I look at you, I see a church that is characterized by love. And there's nothing better that our Lord could say about a church than that your church is a loving church. I mean, isn't that what he said he measured us by if we're disciples of his? John 13, 35, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you, what? Have love one for another. I mean, that's the measuring stick. That's how I know whether you're a follower or not, if you love each other, right? And what a great compliment for this church that they loved each other in that church. And so love is that single identifying mark that we belong to him. And my prayer for our church is that we would love God with all of our heart, that we would love each other as we love ourselves and it, it be a place where the people love one another, the pastor loves the people, the people love the pastor and the staff, and 
the whole church has a love for the lost and the unchurched. Now, people at a church that's like that, people want to come to a church like that. Like that. A people where the people are loving, or a church where the people are loving. They feel the warmth of love that they don't find anywhere else. So that paired with that love was their service. Um, and service really is the visible evidence of love. The, the Greek word that's used here is diakonia. Uh, diakonia. So it's the word from which we get the word deacon or servant, right? And it means, uh, you know, those deeds, these gestures, great and small, of love. Um, they were noticed by the Lord. They might go unnoticed by the people. But he saw their deeds. He saw their deeds of service. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that happens in a church that if it stopped happening, everybody would take notice. As it's going on, nobody really cares. They're just, you know, take advantage of it, assume it. Just say, well, you know, we're always going to get coffee every Sunday morning. <laughs> but it takes somebody out there to do it, right, to fix that coffee. But if it stopped, everybody would take notice, right? Well, that's what we're talking about here. This was a church that, that uh, not only loved each other, but they proved their love through their service. They secondly, uh, this invisible motivation of faith matched their visible evidence of perseverance. He saw their faith, but once again, he's dealing with an invisible quality, and so their faith was made visible by their triumphant perseverance. They kept keeping on, they kept pressing on, in spite of the persecution, in spite of the difficulties, in spite of the circumstances, they pressed on. And so can the Lord look at our church and say that our deeds of service are motivated by love and that our perseverance is undergirded by our faith? I hope he can. But then he adds the crowning commendation. I love this. Look at this. This is crazy good. He says, I know that you're now doing what? You're doing more now than you were doing at the first. Now that is a commendation, isn't it? I mean, I love that. They're doing more and more instead of less and less. Now contrast the church at Ephesus, the very first church, with this church. What did he say to the church at Ephesus? They, he, he said, you need to recover the deed you did at first. You, you, you've slipped, okay? You're sliding a little bit, Ephesus. But to this church at Thyatira, he says, man, you're going upward, you're going onward, you're going higher, you're going further, you're doing more and more and more, not less and less and less. Can that be said of your Christian life? As you look at yourself and you let the Lord look at you and look on your heart with those penetrating, probing eyes of His that can see the truth of it, are you doing less and less? Or are you doing more and more? Are you going higher and higher? Or are you going lower and lower in your commitment to the Lord? Again, not only true of, in, uh, of, of churches, it's true of individuals. You know, I, I've had people, it's funny, um, when I was a pastor for 20 years, I had people that, uh, that came to me and basically said, you know, they've done pretty much every job in the church and, and they were tired and they were like, you know, it's time for somebody else to step up and so I'm going to retire from active Christian service. Now, I look at their lives, they hadn't quit anything else, they're still recreating with a vengeance, they're just doing more and more you know, projects now that they're retired, they're doing other stuff uh, that they didn't get to do before, uh, spending more and more time with other things, and I look around at their lives and it's onward and upward and more and more, but with a solemn look as if they were graduating valedictorian of their class, they say, you know, I'm ready to retire from my Christian service. I put my time in, I've done all I need to do in this church. And it's time for somebody else to step up. Well, I, I don't see that in the Bible anywhere. Do you? I mean, I, I can be instructed. You know, I, I'm humble enough to take correction on this point. But I don't see anywhere. I mean, I see a Moses uh, <laughs> who at 120 is, is, is going, right? I mean, he's going for it. I see a Caleb who's going for it. I don't see any retirement in the kingdom of God. I don't see, well, it's time for me to step back and somebody to step forward. All I see is an Elijah who throws his cloak off on the next guy and gets in a fiery chariot and goes to heaven. That's all I see, okay? I don't, I don't see retirement in this book, do you? Uh, and yet there are a lot of people who kind of say, well, I want to do less and less and less. 
because I'm tired, I'm old, or whatever, you know. But I kind of like what a, a mentor of mine said, Raymond D. Armand. He was the interim pastor at this church. I don't know if anybody remembers him, but he was an interim pastor at, I don't know, about 18 or 20 churches in the area. And, uh, you know, he used to say this. He, he said, don't retire, refire. He said, don't rust out, burn out for Christ. And I think that is a great way to put it. And so that's what we need to have the attitude of right there. Yeah, and, let me ask you a question. Yeah. You're talking about service for God. Yes. Uh, in the church. Yes. Now, there's the church we go to. Yes. And there's a church at large. Yes. I'll be honest with you. I do a good bit in this church, but I don't do what I used to do in my home church. Right. I used to not go out as much and to other churches, mm -hmm. and I don't want to get braggadocious. But I'm involved with Manly and some things. I'm yeah. involved yeah. with uh, Arrowhead and some things. I'm involved with New Market Church, a, mm -hmm. a community church. But the recovery stuff that, yes. that I've now have yeah. become, that's been my ministry. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm not, Some sometimes we may think people are pulling back from their own church and retiring mm -hmm. and they're not really doing yeah. much yeah. when they are yeah. Yeah. doing. Mother, yeah, I have a totally busy. different ministry now. I'm as myself. Busy outside of this church I, as I yeah, am same here. I mean, I have a totally different ministry. Yeah. I'm not a pastor anymore, so but I'm now pastoring that. pastors all over the country, and you know, this is my contribution to this particular local church. Right. But most of my contribution is to churches all over the nation. So I, I'm totally with you. I understand what you're saying. Okay. Not limiting it to this local body but that's the ideal is that everybody in the church my philosophy as pastor was nobody has two jobs before everybody has one and most people in the church don't. so I'm just saying that you know we could probably do more and more <laughs> in our service right yeah well that's like me when I was at my other church I've done the Sunday Joe and like what Kathy does but then when I came here there was so much to offer you know, for me to get involved in. Mm -hmm. and my son says, Mommy, you just, you know, church is more important to you than your grandkids. I said, No, there's just so many things to do, and God has made it a way for me to be able to do things now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm living now. And mm -hmm. what I was last, last year or the year before last. And mm -hmm. I said, It's just what, whatever is the opportunity for you to get involved in, do to show your faith and show. Mm -hmm love for God. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. Good, good service. I mean, that's what he's talking about, doing more and more, and he's commending this church for that. But then he gets down to this part. Uh, he commends them. He says a positive word. Um, but then he comes around to the negative side of it. And that characterizes the, the honesty of the Lord, the integrity of the Bible. For after the commendation, the thrice holy Son of God comes around with this word in the King James uh, that's translated nevertheless right <laughs> nevertheless there's always that nevertheless of scripture right uh, it's never all completely positive for most situations especially for most of us but and I and I would just say be quick to say that you know it's it, it's it's good to be positive it's good to be affirmative it's good to be encouraging and commending but sometimes you have to say nevertheless you got to do it with your kids you know, and yet, and, and a pastor certainly needs to do it in the church. He's not being a man of God if he doesn't come around sometimes and say, "Nevertheless, right? For as energetic as its deeds, and as flaming as its love, and as enduring as its perseverance, the Lord had a big problem with this little church in Thyatira, and that was at this point of tolerance." Not the way the PC folks describe it and define it, but the way the Bible does. They were tolerating an individual who was misleading the church. And he identifies her here as Jezebel. Not her real name, more than likely, right? Now, you remember Jezebel. She was that 
pagan Phoenician uh, wife of Ahab, king of Israel, and she was the one who brought the worship of Baal and Asherah into the northern kingdom of Israel, seduced uh, Israel to follow these foreign gods. And uh, you remember that she spent, the uh, Bible says that she painted her face. Uh, <laughs> she painted her face and so spent the first half of the day putting on her war paint and the last half of the day on the war path. I mean, she, uh, <laughs> she was a rough, she was a rough customer. I mean, she, she might have looked good on the outside, but man, she was something else on the inside. Woe be unto anyone who got in her way, including her hapless husband, Ahab, right? You remember Jezebel. And um, not only did she introduce pagan worship of Baal and Asherah, but she suppressed true worship of Yahweh God. It wasn't just that we're going to add this uh, element to, to the worship of uh, the Israelites, but we're going to suppress. How did she suppress the true worship of God? She persecuted the prophets, rounded them up. They had to go into hiding, remember? And, and Elijah was on the run constantly from this little woman who painted her face and was on the war path, right? All the time after him, trying to get him. Uh, and, and it says here that, um, that, that this woman in this church is called Jezebel. Now, who was this person, this modern-day Jezebel, at least in this time, first century? We don't know. We don't know. Probably not a real name, because I don't think anybody would have named their child Jezebel, <laughs> right? I, I mean, I've heard some cows named Jezebel. Um, and I've done baby dedications for years, and I've dedicated a Matthew and a Mark and a Luke and a John, but never a Judas. I have never dedicated a boy named Judas, and I don't think anybody would have named their baby on purpose uh, Jezebel. So I think it's used of our Lord here as a symbol of the nefarious nature and the iniquitous influence of this woman on this congregation. Uh, and according to verse 20, she claimed to be something. What was that? Prophetess. Claimed to be a prophetess, right? Now, God hadn't called her to preach. God hadn't called her to teach. She seemed to be self-appointed. Um, and we read here that she misleads my servants, right? Now, we can deduce from this that she's engaged in false teaching based on some claim that she had an additional revelation. Now, do we have any women in history, more modern history, where that was true with a cult? Christian scientists ring a bell? If you go to a Christian scientist reading room, you'll find a Bible, and you will find another book added to the Bible that is called Science and Health with a Key to the Scriptures written by a lady that was married about four times, I think, Mary Baker Patterson Glover Eddy. Um, anyway, but in, it's an addition to the Word of God. But remember what the, the book of the Revelation says about additions? They're under a curse, right? And so she had an additional revelation that Jesus later identifies as the deep secrets of, you read it, Satan. Oh, so... This addition to the Word of God, Jesus characterizes in the harshest way this woman and her teaching here. So this so-called prophetess uh, is teaching uh, and, and seducing, she, it says in verse 20, teaching and seducing my servants to practice what? Sexual. Sexual immorality and to food sacrifice to idols. Same problem as at Pergamum. Remember, we read that last week. But there's something more here that we need to take note of. And that is, they were tolerating her, and they were entering into her false teaching and her compromise, okay? And it was tough not to do some of this in that culture, in that society. Remember we talked about um, the fact that you had all this idol worship that was going on in these towns, and I, I named all the different temples to... to Diana and Artemis and Zeus last week, the throne, throne of Satan was basically probably Zeus's throne. All these foreign gods. You can imagine how much business was associated with that whole deal. Whether it was construction of temples, whether it was uh, gold laying on 
idols, whether it was actually the molding of idols from clay. I mean, there, there was a lot of business associated with false god worship in, these, in, these, in this culture, okay? And so you have to understand that not only did you have that, but you also had unions, you had trade guilds that people were members of. If you were a business person, typically you were a member of a guild, you were a member of a union, right? And they were big in Thyatira. It was a blue collar town, everybody was a part of some trade guild or union. Brick masons had their uh, union, artisans had their union, fabric makers had their union. Anybody remember somebody from Thyatira that was a seller of purple? come to mind? Lydia. Ah, yeah. Book of Acts, right? Acts 16. Lydia, the seller of purple. She probably was a member of a union, a trade guild uh, here in uh, Thyatira. Probably belonged to the fabric makers union. And at these union meetings, you know what went on? They usually poured out a libation, a drink offering to the pagan god that was the patron for that union. Every union, every trade guild had a pagan god as the patron of it. So they would pour out a libation and they would sacrifice an animal and they would give part of it to the priest doing the, doing the sacrifice and the rest of it they would eat. And that animal would be blessed in the name of the pagan god. So if you were a business person and you wanted to stay in business, you had to play the game. You had to go to these feasts uh, that were associated with your trade guild. And the temptation would be, as a believer, to say, well, I got to go along to get along and to stay in business here, I'm going to have to play the game and eat meat sacrificed to the pagan god of my trade union. Now that created a problem. Remember, it wasn't just the pinch of incense at the altar of Caesar we're dealing with. We're also dealing with your job, <laughs> your livelihood, okay? And this was a big deal. And this, this was true in, in, uh, in, in Thyatira. Again, the statuary people made the statues, the gilders put the gold on the statues, the painters who painted the the, them, you know, and the masons, the builders who helped build the temples to them, and on and on we could go. And so they actually came to an early church father by the name of Tertullian. I don't know if you've ever heard his name. Um, but they said, what can we do? I mean, uh, you know, our whole way of life is wrapped up in this idolatry. Uh, how do we, and, and this is how we make ends meet. This is the way we feed our families. This is the only way we can live, preacher. They said to Tertullian. And then in response to their plea, Tertullian wrote one of the most famous statements in early church history when he said, the Latin words were, vivere ergo habis. The translation, must you live? <laughs> they said, this is the only way we can make a living. Is to compromise our faith in Christ. And the preacher's response back was, must you live? Stay true to the Lord regardless, even if it means your own death. That's what the church father had to say. Well, because this compromise was, you know, not only had the, the financial pressure to participate, lose their livelihood. I mean, there's you know tough choices to make when you decide to follow Jesus. I mean, I'm thinking about poor old Jack Phillips. Remember, we just had the Supreme Court ruling for him, the cake baker in Colorado that had been charged by the Colorado Civil Rights Commission with discrimination. Remember, this court ruled in his favor and we're so happy. Neil Gorsuch leading the charge, you know, getting the ruling right and saying, no, you guys were the ones discriminating, not him. You discriminated against him and his faith. The very day that the Supreme Court accepted his case, back in 2017, an attorney walked into his cake shop who was transitioning. Ernie's not here to hear this. Transitioning 
from male to female and they ordered a cake this this attorney he she ordered a cake that was blue on the outside and he wanted it pink on the inside to show that he was transitioning from male to female yeah. now I mean they just about shut this guy's business down in Colorado but he stayed true to the faith he's like must you live I mean he's like I won't live if it means compromising I won't make a living if it means comp I'm not going to compromise my beliefs and my faith in Christ I'm not going to do it and so now the Colorado Civil Rights Commission after being slapped by the Supreme Court with the ruling has decided he's discriminating against somebody again they're trying to shut him down again that's the cost of following Christ in the culture we're living in today. This Thyatira thing and what they had to deal with then, that was then. Hey, this is now. It's coming around again, folks. Yes, sir. Um, with your background and everything, I've, I've thought about this a lot. And you're, you're, mm. in, you're, in, the, you're in the battleground on it. Tolerance, <coughs> correctness, and all. Mm. Do you think it's more of an issue in the government in that, and I'm thinking in these terms, Christ said, you know, my kingdom is not of this world. Mm -hmm. I had this discussion with a friend years ago. Or is it a more serious problem that we see it in the church? Oh, I think we're seeing it more and more in the church. It's not only in the government, but it's, it's coming home now. And particularly in the business world, uh, we're seeing it more and more and more. Just like that law, that, well, it's not a law yet, but it'll be a law in, in California. I mean, that's going to come to the church too. A pastor who's preaching the Bible and who gets paid to do so, he gets a salary, and he's encouraging people to stay true to the book. The book says that homosexuality, uh, lesbianism, whatever you want to call it, transgenderism, it's an abomination. He's going to be fined for that. I mean, it's, it's getting, yeah. The sense of, <laughs> the sense of same sex marriage, I guess. It's, yes. To me, it's disturbing the court decision. I was yes. In conversation with a friend of this fellow judge. It's, it was I said, you know what disturbs me more are denominations that are allowed people to preach for the Yes. Oh, yes. The compromise that is advancing, taking our cues from culture rather than Christ and His Word. I mean, that's exactly what's going on today. So, here's, you know, here's the deal. This is what they were dealing with in this church. And, you know, I'm sure there were people in the church who were saying, well, you know, who are we to judge? And, you know, um, we, we, and they were allowing this this woman to you know teach this false doctrine and and said you know I don't necessarily agree with her viewpoint on that but I mean who am I to tell her what to teach or whatever uh, or you know it's probably even unchristian to oppose a person like this because that way we would be uh, not maintaining the unity of the body and the bond of peace uh, they I've had people throw out all kinds of biblical references to justify their uh, you know cowardice I guess uh, but, you know, even Ephesians 4, maybe somebody might even refer to that one where it talks about the goal of everything is unity, right? No, he says the unity in the faith. And that faith, Jude says, was once delivered to the saints. I mean, that's where the unity needs to be is in the faith, not just unity for unity's sake, right? And so our unity should be in the faith, as he says there, um, you know, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to the mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes and so our unity needs to be focused on the once delivered faith to the saints not just some kumbaya feeling <laughs> you know and that's what they were doing in this church so it's not unchristian to oppose error. In fact, we find it over and over again in the scriptures where they did that. The, the prophets did it all day long in the Old Testament, right? Paul did it in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 1, if anybody preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. I mean, I, and on and on I could go, but i got five minutes left, so I can't give you all those scriptures. But notice the consequences here, verses 22 and 23. He's going to throw her onto a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her, that is, those who engage in her te false teaching, not literally ad adultery, I'm sure, will throw, I'm going to throw them in great tribulation unless they repent of her works, uh, and I will strike her children dead. So the offspring of her teaching, I'm going to wipe them out. Judgment's coming. 
Judgment's coming. Suffering coming to Jezebel, death to her hellish offspring. Why? The end of verse 23. So that all the churches will know what? Exactly. I am who I said I am. <laughs> and that's the one who is the judge at the end of the day. So, before that sobering word, though, came the word of correction. And I kind of had to flip these around because they don't fit neatly into these categories. But if you look at it in verse 21 and 22, what's he saying? There's some amazing grace here. Isn't that like God? He's giving her time to do what? Repent. That's grace. That's mercy. She's got an opportunity here. And those who are following her have an opportunity. And then in verse 22, after this fearful description of judgment, he says all this fearful judgment is coming unless they repent. So he's given space. You know, you, you think that if anybody crossed the line, if anybody passed the point of no return, it had been this woman Jezebel and those that she had deceived into following her. And yet the risen Lord, whose eyes are like a laser beam of fire and these smoldering feet of, of judgment, said, no, I've given her time to change, to, for a change of mind that leads to a change of heart, that leads to a change of action and lifestyle. I'm giving her time to repent. You see, God would much rather correct us than condemn us. He would much rather pardon us then punish us. That is our God. Folks, the opportunity to repent is a gracious gift from God and He offers us a span of time. So if you ever doubt the long-suffering, patience and mercy and compassion and love of our Lord, look at these words. Because a woman that evil is given an opportunity to repent. Does, do you not think that he gives us the same thing? He does. He's a good, good father. Yes, he is. Right? <laughs> he is. Right? And then there's this word of comfort. And i got to go quick. Uh, he gives this word of comfort to the segment of the church not involved in all this stuff. He said, you know, there's some of these people in the church who have been swayed by her. They've been deceived by her. They've gone with her into her error. But there's a segment of the church that had not. They had stayed true, right? And he commends this segment of the church for their ever-increasing love, their faith, their service, their perseverance. He condemns it for, its, for their tolerance, and he calls for repentance. But then he makes this promise in verses 24 and 25, and it's always beautiful. I love the way he ends these letters for those who overcome. Don't you? <laughs> but to the rest of you at Thyatira who do not hold this teaching who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. To you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. So, here's this mystic prophetess, uh, you know, adding new revelations to the teachings of Christ and the apostles that she calls the deep secrets of the Lord Jesus, says they're really just Satan's, right? Break fellowship with these deceivers and at the same time hold fast to the faith that was once delivered to the saints. Cling to it till I come. And folks, as we get closer and closer to the second coming of our Lord, there's going to be more and more Jezebels in the church. More deceivers and more deceivers. More people who are promoting evil propaganda that is just, you know, that. It's not the teaching of Scripture. It is error. You're going to see it more and more and more the closer we get to the return of our Lord. And so he says, hold fast to the faith till I come. And, and as in all these letters, they end with a challenge and a promise issued to the individual. Even if the church doesn't listen, you listen, right? And to those who overcome, verse 26, to the one who conquers, to the one who keeps my works until the end, that's perseverance, by the way. That's not a given, by the way. That's something that we got to work at, by the way. That's what he says here. To the one who keeps my works until the end, to the one who conquers, overcomes, what will he give us? Authority over the nations. Wow. 
You know, when he comes back to rule and reign on a restored earth in Jerusalem, he's going to rule over what's left after the Antichrist does his worst and he's defeated. There are going to be people alive and left on this earth for a thousand years while he reigns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords from Jerusalem. Thousand year reign. And guess what? He's telling us right here. You're going to reign with him if you overcome. <laughs> That's amazing to me. And then he actually quotes here uh, at verse 27, he quotes out of Psalm 2.9, which was the coronation of the kings of Israel. Uh, recognized his messianic psalm. Later applied to the Lord Jesus and fulfilled at his coming again. He says, he will rule them with what? These nations that are left over who followed the Antichrist and didn't die. He's going to rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. And I myself have received authority from my father. So here's this inconspicuous church in this tiny town. There's Thyatira and other places of insignificance. And yet he gives this amazing promise to this tiny church. <laughs> if you hold on, keep persevering in these good works, hold on to the faith once del delivered to the saints, you're going to reign and rule with me. And then he says one more thing. And i got to quit because my time's gone. One more promise. Look at that. If you hold on to what you have, if you overcome, if you'll do my will to the end, I'll give you the morning star. Now what do you mean by that? Have you ever seen what is referred to, the, to as the morning star? You ever been up early enough? I know Ernie has. He's been up early enough to see the morning. You've, you've seen it. Those of you get up early, it's easier now than it was two months ago, right, to get up early and see the morning star. You get up early in the morning and before daylight, you look at the horizon close to where the sun is going to rise and you'll see the brightest star in fact, all the other stars fade as the light starts coming from the dawn, except that one. We call it the morning star. It's actually a planet, right? It's usually Jupiter or Venus. I forget which are the ones that are usually called the morning star. But when do you see that again? When is that morning star most visible? Darkest part of the night, right before the dawn, right? Wow. So the risen Lord is saying that just when the night seems darkest, just when the persecution seems harshest, just when Satan's forces seem fiercest, just when it seems that all ho hope is lost, I'm going to appear to you in the darkest part of the night as the bright and the morning star. There's hope. But I wonder if he's not speaking of himself. For in Revelation 22 verse 16 he identifies himself as the bright and the morning star. At the end of all, it all, if you're faithful, it is I who will shine forth in the darkness, herald the dawn of my kingdom. You know Peter, he speaks of the end of the age when all the planets are going to disappear the circuit of the heavens will, will just roll up like a scroll, every star will fall from the sky. It's as if our Lord is saying, when the day is done, the battle is won, that single bright light you'll see forever and ever will be none other than me. I am the bright and the morning star. At the transfiguration, when Peter and James and John looked up, and you remember Elijah and Moses had been with him and he began to shine with the glory of God, glory of the heavens, and they heard the heavenly voice, this is my beloved son, listen to him. The words of Deuteronomy 18.15. You remember that when the clouds lifted, Elijah and Moses were gone. The scripture says plainly and clearly, they saw no one save Jesus only. Isn't that a wonderful truth that someday when every temptation is gone, every distraction's disappeared, that we'll spend forever and ever and ever worshiping the one who is the bright and the morning star. It's our Lord's way of saying, 
that if you're faithful, if you will hold on to the faith once delivered to the saints, your reward when I come again is actually me, the bright and the morning star. What a promise to a tiny church. What a promise to this church. What a promise to you if you overcome. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this lengthy letter to this tiny church that has such glowing words of commendation, some such scary words of condemnation about tolerance that really is treason against heaven's king. Lord, we pray that we'd stay true to you regardless, even if we lose our livelihood over serving you. Even if we lose our lives themselves because we name you as King and Lord. And God, we thank you that if we'll hold fast, if we'll overcome, that you'll give us yourself, the bright and the morning star. Thank you for that, Lord. We look forward to your coming, even as the night is growing darker and darker and darker. We know that you will split the night sky with the brightness of your presence and you'll come on clouds with great glory. We look forward to that day, Lord. In your blessed name, amen. Have a great week.